15 times you have knocked back voluntary euthanasia. 15 times you have decided that South Australians do not deserve the right to choose when and how they die. 15 times you, our leaders, have chosen not to prevent cruelty and not to protect our human rights. How many times must we illegally euthanise for the prevention of cruelty, advocating for our human right to choose, until you give us what we deserve and have a right to? Voluntary euthanasia for those that are terminally ill should be legal. To be given the choice is to be provided a sense of dignity. The prevention of cruelty and protection of human rights is one of South Australia's core values. As our leaders, I know that this is very important to you. However, forcing a terminally ill patient to live in unbearable pain is practically torture. I recently met a lovely lady called Lucy living in Adelaide, whom unfortunately suffered from motor neurons disease for 20 years. She wanted to pass in peace. However, she was atrociously told that active euthanasia would be considered murder and unethical. She felt as though her body was a prison and her mind the prisoner. She lived in constant pain, slowly deteriorating with achingly painful joints and unrelenting fatigue and exhaustion. You could not call that living. Yet all she received was assurances and promises of a cure someday. She died last week. Allowing terminally pain-ridden people like Lucy the right to move on from a constantly torturous life should not be a question of society's respect for the sanctity of life. It should be countered to can we respect a person's basic human rights and rather help prevent cruelty? It can be identified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that every human being has the inherent right to life, protected by law. No one shall be subjectively deprived of his life. How is it that humans have a civil and political rights to life, but not death? All human beings should have the right to choose how they die and when they die. Walk a mile in these people's shoes. Would you really call it living if you were stuck in a hospital bed, restricted to certain aspects of life, not given a choice in the matter? There is no distinguishable moral difference between commission and omission in the medical withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Nevertheless, active euthanasia is considered murder and passive euthanasia is acceptable. At the moment in South Australia, the Advanced Care Directives Act 2013 allows patients to execute formal directives in writing, specifying their wishes concerning medical treatment, including refusal. Moreover, if the doctors find grounds for assuming that stopping life-sustaining treatments is in the best interest of severely incompetent patients, then passively euthanising is acceptable. However, if the doctor foresaw death and knew actively stopping treatment would result in death, then how can it be justified as passive? It is stated that passive euthanasia is death from natural causes, whilst active euthanasia is death deliberately caused. How is deliberately causing death to end a person's already dying life different from deliberately stopping a medically necessary action knowing that the result will be death? How is it that because Lucy was not in an induced coma or not taking life-extending drugs, that she must, against her own wishes, suffer and die from natural causes? If it can be morally justifiable to deliberately halt the medical treatment at a patient's request, then it must be morally admissible to provide the medical means to the patient to die at their request. It can be said that there are numerous concerns relating to abuses and protection of the vulnerable, that many patients are likely to exploit the legalisation of euthanasia. Therefore, implementing certain objective safeguard conditions will allow terminally ill individuals to exercise his or her right to die with dignity. These certain conditions can be seen positively working in the Northern Territory, whereby through the Northern Territory Terminally Ill Act, a doctor must be satisfied as to the terminal nature of the prognosis. I know you all work diligently to ensure that all acts written up and legalised have their own conditions to ensure protection of possible exploitation. Therefore, I know that when the act of legalising euthanasia arises, you will do your utmost to protect the act. Further, there are frequent countries that show voluntary euthanasia having a positive impact on the lives of people globally. Switzerland, for example, in 2015 had 959 people utilise their voluntary euthanasia services and it's continually rising. One of their patients stated that they felt very emotional but at the same time at peace, avidly depicting that voluntary euthanasia has tremendous mental health benefits. 
These services are providing people around the globe the ability to die with dignity and retain positive mental health benefits. But we can do better. We can provide Australians the care and respect they are craving from their country. We can provide them peace and dignity. We can provide them all this without forcing them to make a difficult journey across the world and without having to pay thousands of dollars. Why should only those that are well-endowed have the choice to die in peace? Consequently, euthanasia should be legal. It is not our right to deny those a choice. We are all human. We all deserve the right to freedom of choice. We all deserve an equal chance of living the way we choose, but also the way we want to die. By denying this choice, are we not, as South Australians, going against our core values to respect each other, provide equality for all, and to love and care for one another? Death should not be subjugated to certain causes like an animal forced into a cage. Death and life go hand in hand, and those that are not living, that are terminally ill, should have the right to peacefully pass on. Your help, as our political leaders, is urgently needed. Give our community the choice of active euthanasia. Make euthanasia legal.